Good morning and welcome to Get on the Bus Reader's Advisory. My name is Sarah from the Wyoming State Library and today's presentation is Reader's Advisory on the Fly. I'm going to just go over a few uh, details about the Reader's Advisory series, a few things that we did cover on our first session on Tuesday and some things that I may have, may have missed as well. Um, all of the programs, which uh, again start at this past Tuesday and will continue through mid-May, are available to view at getonthebuswyoming.wordpress.com. The webinar will usually be posted later in the day or early the next day following the live webinar. And each program will have its own page at this site. When you first go to getonthebuswyoming.wordpress.com, there's a little introductory page which, with a few uh, details. And then I encourage you to look at the introduction page, which also has some more information um, for teacher librarians and school media specialists and any other educators out there. The program has been um, uh, approved for one and a half CEUs, and there's information about um, getting that credit on the introduction page. And then we are also encouraging folks to um, participate in the homework assignments that I'll show you in just a moment. Um, anyone who participates will be eligible for a $25 Amazon gift certificate. And if we get a lot of folks to participate, we um, may be able to give away um, uh, registration to the this September's WLA conference in Cheyenne and or possibly um, a Nook e-reader. So, so far we just have um, uh, six or seven folks who have done the homework for from the first session. It's only been a few days, so that's okay. And while I would love to give all of you some of those really cool prizes, um, we got to make the odds a little tougher. So let your coworkers know, and everyone will have till the end of May to participate in that. So Tuesday's session was What Appeals to Your Patrons. We just click on that link. There, you'll get a little bit of information. Cass from the University of Wyoming uh, did that presentation. There is the link to the video uh, webinar there. There are some uh, the homework questions um, in the middle of the page. You can see that some folks already started to respond. And when you scroll all the way to the bottom, the screen may be going um, a little choppy for you right now. All the way at the bottom of the page, you will see um, a text box with leave a reply. The only thing that will appear is your name, and you can just put your first name if you want. I will um, see the email, though, and that's how we'll be able to track who has participated. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with Reader's Advisory on the fly. So just real quickly, a little bit about me and my um, Reader's Advisory background. I have worked in the past in a variety of uh, public libraries in a variety of positions. Uh, I've worked reference um, and bookmobile services and several different types of outreach programs that um, working specifically with, with homebound populations, which is usually pretty Reader's Advisory intensive. And also prior to that, and I'm sure there's some of you out here who have the same experience, I've worked as a bookseller in uh, several different retail bookstores. And I think that's always a really good place to get a start on your reader's advisory training. Of course, sales is the bottom line, but you're certainly surrounded by the newest and, and greatest stuff that's coming in to the door, which is always pretty cool. So if you read the little blurb or intro to um, my program that's both on the WordPress page and ones that we sent out in the um, the Outrider, I talked about that I was going to be talking about when uh, tools for when we need to do a quick transaction. And I'm still going to be covering that, you know, when we have the rushed patron or we get stopped in the stacks. And I'm still going to talk about some great tools and some of my favorite websites that I like for those situations, some kind of ready reference situations. But as I began to think about the term on the fly a little bit more and was compiling information for this session, I began to realize that there's a deeper reason that these on the fly services occur more frequently in advisory services than um, in-depth conversations as we see more often with reference information services. And I'm certainly going to say right here, I'm not an expert, I'm just going with my experience and observations and my interactions with customers throughout the year. Um, there's no, you know, 
substantial quantitative research here, but I just wanted to share my thoughts on it. My perception is that when patrons of any age come to us with a reference question, homework, research, whatever it might be, they, they, there's an expectation that there'll be some time involved. They come up to the, refer the service desk and they think, okay, well, the librarian's going to type a few things into the catalog or database. They're going to go out to the stacks and flip through a few books. They kind of have a sense that there's going to be some, some time spent in this. Certainly we get that rushed in patient patron during a reference transaction too, but more often than not, I think they know that there's going to be a little time involved. Their, their questions often will start with, I'm looking for, or can you help me with, and, and they know that together we're going to take a little journey to find what they need. But when it comes to a patron seeking out a really good story for, just for the purpose of entertainment, for pleasure reading, whatever it might be, often the question is, What's a good book to read? And how often have, have all of us heard uh, patrons come and you know sit at the desk and say, oh, it must be so nice to be a librarian. You get to sit around and read all day. And of course, we smile and nod, and in our head, we're rolling our eyes. Oh, if you only knew. I think that you know patrons trust that we will help them with their information needs but and and are willing to um, accept that we won't always have the answer at the top of our head but when it comes to pleasure reading there is this misperception that we have read every book from the Odyssey to Oprah's latest pick and for us feeling that need to buy into this um, misperception can lead to some of it, that anxiety about readers advisory that Cass spoke about on Tuesday in the first session. So how do we prepare ourselves for this? First of all, you know, we need to understand that that's, you know, we can't read everything. And I think all of us listening today do really understand that. But when we get posed a question that seems so definitive as what's a good book to read, you feel compelled to have like 200 titles at the top of your head at any given moment. So one thing that um, Cass mentioned in Tuesday's session was she said read widely. And um, I took this to mean two different things. One, to become a voracious reader, which we all know can be challenging um, with our busy schedules and lives. Um, and she also meant it to say, um, read beyond the scope of what your personal interests are. And this is a really way, a good way to get in touch with your individual collection at your school or public library and to better help your patrons. I, I put up on the slide here, read, watch, listen and take this to mean what, however much you need it to be. Read widely, as we've said, watch, and that could be um, watching movies, um, watch your coworkers interact with patrons and get some reader's advisory tips from them. Listen, again, that might be listening to music or downloadables in your collection, also listening to your patrons and what their needs and wants are. Don't feel pressured, though, to read 10 books away, a week. Maybe some of you out there do. You may have coworkers that do, but you need to read at your own pace. Take in the story and ask your coworkers. You know, again, you're not going to be able to read everything. I found that little image of uh, picking your coworkers' brain there. They are it's just as good of a valuable resource as any of the, you know, library journal and, and all of those resources that we have. What's another way to um, prepare yourself or get yourself ready to talk about Reader's Advisory? Promote your programs. Maybe you're the one developing programs, maybe someone else does, but you've got flyers out there and you're saying, hey, we have this cool event on Saturday, come to the library. Well, maybe you read a book on the topic. You can. Someone comes up to you and says, hey, what's a good book to read? And you say, you know, we've got this wellness program from a, a, a clinic on Saturday, and I just read this really interesting book on, um, you know, new 
I don't know, I'm going off the top of my head here, but new fads in nutrition or something like that. Um, obviously, it makes it even easier when maybe you have an author program. We have this author coming in. Here are some, some of his books, and maybe you want to read those and come to our program. So what a great way to combine both your collection and the community programming you have happening in your library. Quick ways. Again, you're not going to be able to read everything, so look, th look um, peruse the book jackets, look um, at websites. We'll be going over some websites here in a little bit. And Picks and Pans was my reminder to, um, to tell you, although we have a lot of great resources such as Library Journal, School Library Journal, Publishers Weekly, what are our patrons reading to get their inspiration to read? Entertainment Weekly, I don't even think People calls it Picks and Pans anymore, but People and Entertainment Weekly are two popular magazines, Time and Newsweek as well, often have book review sections. The, your local newspaper or the larger newspapers like the Wyoming Tribune or the Denver Post are going to have large book review sections on Sunday. Um, that's what our, our patrons are looking at, and that's where they're going to be coming to you with that clipping and saying, hey, do you have this, or what can you tell me about this book? And the last, and this is something that you will see on the homework uh, as one of the homework assignments for this session, is practice a 30-second hook. Think of how to do a sales pitch for a story in 30 seconds or less. How would you describe that? Some of you may already incorporate book talks into your programming or book clubs or school outreach events. I personally think of book talks as more of a short presentation or performance. With a hook or a 30 second hook as I'm calling it here, think about grabbing a few key pieces from a story. Those um, flashy reviews or quotes that you see on a book jacket or in the inside cover of a book um, nicely demonstrate how to do a quick sales pitch of a story. And the last piece that I can say to this, which also may seem obvious, but I guess I'm saying it may be more for my benefit, um, is don't lie. <laughs> Admittedly, when I worked in bookstores, I lied a lot. I'm just going to put that out there. People would say, oh, what do you think about this book? And, and if, if you listened to me back then, you would have sworn I w w read about 200 books a week because every time someone came up to me, I said, oh, it's great, da 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 da, -da. And I was developing reader's advisory skills at that time because I was starting to connect um, author read-alikes and oh you might also want to read this but oftentimes they weren't anything that I actually read so I do think to um, instill that credibility it's perfectly okay to admit that you haven't read everything what do you think of this book you know what I haven't read it but my coworker is a huge fantasy reader let me see if she's available to, to talk with or you know, let me show you um, a good website that has uh, reviews of uh, the latest fantasy novels. I really need to read those at some point, but I just haven't gotten around to it. So I think that, you know, establishes that, that trust. But boy, did I, in my early days, I lied a whole bunch. So don't do as I say, not as I do. So that's a lot of steps there. We, we went over quite a few things, and again, some of those will be incorporated into your homework assignments, so you'll get a chance to review those after the web webinar. Um, but try a few of them on for size, see what works for you, and what I would recommend, too, with any of those steps, at any given time, have four or five titles handy at the tip of your brain that you're passionate about recommending. And with those four or five titles, think about how you can make connections from several different directions. We talked on Tuesday about multiple, um, the different appeal characteristics of character, setting, language, and story. And think about your four or five titles and how you can talk about them from a different, um, from different directions. One example that I was thinking of last night was To Kill a Mockingbird a classic novel and a book that I really enjoy. One way to talk about it um, from the character perspective is that you can say if you the book is told through the voice of a child and you get to experience the story of the how the story is playing out 
through the eyes of a little girl. And for somebody that that appeals to, I've read, I like a lot of books that have been told through the voice of a child. Huck Finn is another classic example. So you can talk about the character and, and, and the narrative of that story um, from that point of view. You can also talk about setting with To Kill a Mockingbird. You can say the, you know, that the setting is in the deep south in the 1930s and as you're reading the book you can feel the tension and turmoil that's occurring with all the different populations and communities that were living in the deep south during that time and you you feel that the humidity and you feel the tension so those are two very different ways to to talk about and and um, potentially sell to kill a mockingbird and I'm sure there's other ways and I bet you all can do even better job than me on that now thinking about genres, in the, for the sessions that we have in May, we will be talking about a few different genres. We're not going to be able to cover all of them, but I think it'll be a good way for everyone to get to experience uh, different genres from the perspective of one of our library, um, Wyoming Library colleagues. The, the challenge for me with just using the word genre or using a, a label like romance or mystery is that it it becomes stuck in this niche, right? Um, we'll use a hot topic example of the for the day, Twilight. Um, it would be easy for somebody to say, well, I don't like vampires or I don't like horror because they know Twilight's about vampires and they just immediately shut down to the idea of reading Twilight. Maybe they are an avid romance reader and at the heart of Twilight it is um, it is a romance. And so we need to think about these these genre titles and how we can spin them in a different way. Um, and then in another example I thought about from my bookstore days, um, in the early um, with the early Harry Potter books, I would um, talk to parents who are uncertain about the fantasy element of Harry Potter and say, the books are really about a boy with a sad childhood who do, um, finds friends and discovers his place in the world. Now, a side note on that, I think it's, there really is a whole other conversation to be had about talking with parents about books when they're um, acting as an intermediary between children and, and the book selection. Um, that really is a whole other conversation, but I just wanted to give that example of another way to look at Harry Potter as not just a book about witches and wizards. And, you know, if, if all else fails and you're, however you're having a conversation with a patron, just share your, your passion. And that may inspire them. They may say, gosh, you know, what? I've, I've never read a Western in my life, but they, this person is just talking about it like it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And maybe they'll choose to pick it up. And with all luck, they'll come back and say, this was awesome. Thank you so much. And sometimes I even prefer when they come back and say, you know what? I didn't like this at all. And when you find out why, then that's when you can start to do that process of eliminating. Um, I sometimes find it easier when they tell me why they didn't like a book, sort of the reverse, um, a kind of a reverse interview in, in that way. And the last piece um, to that in, is be in tuned with patron sensitivities, and this is a challenging one, and for those of you in smaller communities, you may develop rapports with your regular patrons, but often we, a lot of our community members, we just see a few times a year. They're going on vacation and they just want to grab a book to put in their bag for vacation. We don't have th these established relationships with them. So this piece can be a little bit challenging. And when I talk about sensitivities, I talk about, I'm, I'm thinking about reading body language and reading facial expressions. And there are elements of books that we can't always find from just reading a book jacket or skimming and sometimes even reading and this can be things like strong language violence um, sexually explicit content um, that's a very subjective thing and what may seem okay for us may not be okay for others and to just be sensitive to that and as i was thinking about sharing this with you i i feel like several years ago i would i found a website or was recommended a website that where there were reviews on books that um, 
uh, kind of rate it, the, the language and the sex. I know there's a lot of sites for that for TV and movies, and it's very possible I'm making this up in my head. So I'm going to keep looking, though, or if anybody out there knows what I may be referring to, um, please share it in the comments part of the um, of the the get on the bus web page so that we can all see that but I'm gonna keep digging like I said I may very well just be making it up in my head as well so that's getting into the a doorway and and having that conversation with with your patron but sometimes just as the saying goes there isn't always a doorway and you have to find a window and my slide doesn't want to click right now so bear with me there we go so thinking of another way to, to connect a reader, that's my idea of finding a window, the doorway and the, having those conversations with your patron and connecting them with books. But sometimes the medium is the message. The appeal to an audiobook reader may be the narrator. And then there's also movies. Movies can have some of the same characteristics as books. And thinking that Advisory services can include, all, and really should include, all parts of our collection. Books, music, movies, downloadables, multimedia experiences on the web, or in our Go Wild databases. And Chris Van Berg will be going through some of our databases next week on that. The expectation that I or misperception as I talked about earlier that library staff know everything about books can can be in, can also be intimidating for a patron we we go in feeling like we have to know everything but for an apprehensive reader they may think oh god they know everything they're going to feel embarrassed that you know be embarrassed that they haven't read a book in years or whatever the case might be so when we think about that conversation we're having, we talked the other day about the question, tell me about the last book you read that you enjoyed. Well, I would say to that, if you see this look of horror on their face, that like, well, the last book I read was, you know, I think Cass used the example of Red Badge of Courage in middle school, um, quickly reevaluate how you're going to have that conversation. Say, you know what, tell me about a book or TV show that you love. And the pictures I put here I, I want to share because I am admittedly um, enjoy movies more than books and I always feel so awful admitting that to a bunch of library people. But yes, I am Sarah and I'm a librarian and I love movies more than books and that's the truth for me. And a lot of that I think for me comes from the fact that I am I'm physically a slow reader and so when I think about reading widely, to me that's setting a goal of reading more than I did last year. It's still not going to be as much as a lot of other people, but it's more than I than my personal best. But the example I have here is the movie um, from the early 2000s, The Mummy, with Brendan Fraser, and the book Elizabeth, um, not book Elizabeth Peters, the book The Mummy Case, which is the first in the Amelia Peabody series by Elizabeth Peters. And this occurred back when I worked at a bookstore and a coworker who knew me well, so in this case she didn't have to have a conversation with me because she knew my interests. I would always go on, you know what, I've never read mysteries, I have no interest, I just you know, had these images of dusty old Agatha Christie books and it had absolutely no appeal to me whatsoever. And I also am um, kind of a wimp and don't like to be scared. And so that was also the piece that never led me into mysteries. Well, um, my friend said, you know what, I think you should try the Elizabeth Peters books. They're a lot like Indiana Jones and The Mummy. And that sold me. Again, in this case, she didn't have to draw out any sort of questions, which normally we would have to do with a patron. She knew that about me, and she was able to make those connections. And for those of you who don't know, um, the Amelia Peabody series is um, about a woman and her boyfriend. Um, live, um, I think turn of the century, turn of the last century, or early twenties, um, who are who work for the British Museum and they have these grand adventures in Egypt and very much like the mummy and then also that you know kind of adventure archaeology slant of, of Indiana Jones and that sold me that one sentence totally sold me and I'll admit I never read the entire series but I did read a few of the books and I really enjoyed them and it got me into mysteries it's still not my go-to um, 
genre, but I'm more open to experiencing mysteries now, all from that connection. So think about other ways that you can make those connections beyond, um, beyond books. Think about those other media elements. Um, and then the one thing I will say to that too is sometimes there are there cinematic and literary elements don't always translate. I really another example from my personal experience. I really love science fiction movies. I don't love all science fiction books. I give them a try, but they don't always work for me. Um, and there are quite a few types. Of, there's a lot of different types of science fiction books, but quite a few of them are very um, techy and go into a lot of detail about machines and spacecraft and whatever it might be. And I that just it's too dry for me, and I it doesn't grab my attention. Whereas in a movie format, you see the spacecraft, you see the technology happening as sort of a as sort of the setting to the the story, and then you can watch the story play out and the characters play out. And so I, I get what I need from the movie that is um, too detail-oriented for me in a book. So sometimes those connections work and sometimes they don't. But that all just takes practice as well. So lastly, I just want to go over some tools, some ready reference tools. These will also be posted on the uh, homework page. I'm not going to go into absolutely every, all of them, but I do want to show you a few cool things from, from some of them. And again, these aren't the be-all, end-all. A lot of this information can be found in a lot of different places. Um, but I just want to go over a few that are some of my favorites. So for a few quick ready reference things that you might have, because sometimes it is just, who wrote this book? What do I read next? Sometimes it is just as simple as that. Um, a, there are a few sites that I, series information you can find in a ton of places. When you get into novelists, they're pretty good about um, uh, you know numbering the series. These are just a few sites that I like. I just like the design of them, so I wanted to share them with you. This one is um, kept up by Kent County Library in Michigan, and I'll just show you this one quickly. My internet's acting a little slow this morning. I just like this because it's a clean site. You can do um, a somewhat advanced search, but I'll just um, do a last name search just to show you how it looks. I'm just going to do Patterson. I'll get the um, James Patterson and Richard North Patterson, and I just like the clean design. It's got the tree, and then it's got all of his series. I can go ahead and click on Maximum Ride. There's the order of Maximum Ride. Again, because this is another library's website, these links will go right into their catalog. But um, And then we'll go to Alex Cross, which you know there's a bunch of those, and there's the, the order of those. So I just like the design of that one. It just is a, a handy one for me. But this information can be found a lot of places. Um, another one that I like, and, and um, this site is a little more... I guess for lack of a better word, a generic looking site. It's a very old site. You can kind of tell it looks like it's been up since 1997, and I think it has been. Um, but this one has always been one I've, I've liked to go to um, for, again, for series, particularly um, science fiction and fantasy series, where there's often a lot of those um, trilogies that in some way connect to one another um, that I don't personally read. I'm just going to show you a few examples so you can see how it's laid out. Tracy Hickman is one of the authors of a popular fantasy series called Dragonlance, and there's a ton of them. And so um, I like this because your, your page may be going a little more choppy than mine, um, but you get all of the the different sh small trilogies and the, the titles of them and um, who he wrote them with because he usually is a co-author. So I just like those. And then this is also a good page for pseudonyms. Go ahead and type in Victoria Holt. And we get all of the books. And in this case, you know, she didn't write any series, but we get all of the um, titles in chronological order that Victoria Holt wrote, wrote. But we also see Victoria Holt is a pseudonym used by Jean Plady. 
So I, I didn't actually point it out, but when we looked at Tracy Hickman, we saw his picture and there was a little bit of information about him. So when we click on Jean Platy, because that's her real name, we'll get to her page with a little more information about her. And then we also see all of the names that she writes under. And she has written under Jean Platy as well. So on this page, if we scroll down, we'll see the series and all the titles that she wrote as Jean Platy, and then we can go ahead and click on her different pseudonyms to get to those pages. So I do find this, this site um, pretty helpful for, um, for pseudonyms. Let me go back. Um, and then the early word and reading group guides, I encourage you to look at those um, during the homework assignments. I'm not going to go over those right now. Then I also listed a few genre-related sites, again, not the be-all, end-all, and there's just two here that I want to point out. I'm not going to look at the mystery, romance, and science fiction ones, but I did want to quickly show Teen Reads. Some of the teen librarians out there may already be familiar with this, but this is a really great site, and I'm I'm pretty sure it's actually maintained by librarians and there are reviews and teens are also allowed to contribute to this. So it's not just adults telling kids what to read, but there are teen reviews on here. Um, there, they have a Facebook page where they do some updates, same with Twitter. Um, there, there is a For Librarians link that offers some collection development information, um, books into movies, again, that media piece. I was speaking um, more to connecting um, si similar movies and books, but obviously there's so much of that media tie-in out there as well, and that's a good way to draw in your younger readers. So this is a, um, I'm not going to go through all of this site, but this is a good, um, a really nice site if you're not already familiar with it um, for your young, younger um, readers. And then lastly, because I did talk about movies, I want to just quickly show you, um, oh, pardon me. Um, IMDB.com. For any movie buff out there, you probably are already familiar with this site, but this is um, the Internet Movie Database, and it's a place to see the latest trailers of movies. Um, for the most part, it's a really good, like, ready reference. You know, what was the name of that Julia Roberts movie in the 90s? You type in Julia Roberts, you get to, you get to all the movies she's ever been in, you'll see the year next to him. It's really good for easy stuff like that. But there are actually some advanced searching tools. And another way in connecting movies with books is, let's say there is a TV show or a movie that is based on a book and the patron doesn't know the title. We'll use a common one that probably many of us are familiar with. But someone comes in and says, you know, I, I know that, um, the, that those Charlene Harris books have been made into a, a TV show, but I don't know what the name of it is because it's not the same as the books. So even though this is a database for movies, actors, producers, and directors, when books are, um, when movies are based on books or TV shows, I think I'm spelling it wrong, um, the writer still gets original credit. If you type in J.K. Rowling, you're going to see original, you know, book, you know, based on the book by J.K. Rowling, so she's going to be indexed. In this case, I didn't actually realize that Charlene Harris actually is a writer on most all of the episodes, so she does come up in this in this case. So we see the author, we get a photo if that's been submitted, and then we see that she's a writer for True Blood. Also, they index quite a bit on IMDb, so maybe the, the patron comes in and says, I love those Sookie Stackhouse books. And again, maybe you don't know what she's talking about. IMDb also indexes character names. So if we type in Sookie Stackhouse, we see a picture of Anna Paquin, who plays Sookie Stackhouse on True Blood. And we're just getting that character page, but then we can click on True Blood to get to the information about the TV show. One other example on this is sometimes more obscure books will be made into movies. A movie I saw a while back was called The Long Walk. I think that's right. No, that's wrong. Pardon me. 
the, <laughs> the movie was called The Way Back. And so someone comes to you and says, I just saw this really cool movie, and I think it was based on a book, but I'm not sure what the book was called or who wrote it. So the movie was called The Way Back, and I look at the writers. IMDb isn't perfect. It's a, I find it a little bit busy. But right in the first p pages, we see two writers, and we see cr screenplay next to their name. So these are the people who wrote the script for the movie. But we see there's one more credit, so I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And it says, I'm not going to even attempt that name, but based on a novel by this gentleman, The Long Walk, The True Story of a Trek to Freedom. So we have the name of the book, and then we can go back and see if we have it in our catalog. Additionally, IMDb does have an advanced search. It's, it can be pre a pretty powerful reference tool if you need it, but you have to dig a little bit. Um, it comes from this top drop-down menu. I clicked on Advanced Search. And then you can do some searching within here, but I usually end up going and clicking again on Advanced Title Search. And from here you can put uh, a word that you think might be in the title, but you don't know the whole title. You can indicate if it was um, a made-for-TV movie or TV or um, film. Um, let's say someone comes in and says, I'm looking for a Jimmy Stewart movie from the 40s, you could put in 1940 to 1949, and, and go on, and you can build your search from there. So there are some good reference um, options within IMDb as well. So I just wanted to point that one out when thinking about all of the media formats we have in our collection. That's really about all I wanted to cover today. Again, these other links will be available on the Get on the Bus webpage, and I'll go back to that right now. Excuse me. Again, your page may be going a little more choppy than mine. Um, and so today's presentation will be archived here at Reader's Advisory on the fly. And we have our homework questions. And I do also, again, want to point out the last question on each page is going to be the same. And it's um, the general question is read or skim a book um, that you normally wouldn't pick up and share your experience with that book. And so we've posted that on every page because, again, some of you may be like me out there who are slower readers, and we want to give you some time to think on that. So that concludes my presentation. I'm going to go ahead and open up my chat box now. And if anybody has any questions or comments, I will go over those now. Again, if you have a mic and if you want to um, speak to the whole group, go ahead and just raise your hand and I will call on you. Bear with me one moment. I just have to maximize my screen. Okay, well it looks like there's no questions or comments for today, so thank you guys very much for participating. And again, this will be archived uh, later today or early tomorrow, and just again let your coworkers know. If you have any questions about PTSB credits or the homework or anything, feel free to email me. My email is at the bottom of the first page of the getonthebus.wordpress.com website. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.